like that title. The greatest eater in the history of mankind. Ever, ever watch that on uh, July 4th? How many of you watch it? I mean, it's like it's a regular thing. You've got to watch it every year. I'm in that category. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about food for the way, and we might talk a little bit about some other things as well. And we are taking our scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It's uh, before us. Let us read together. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality, as it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. This is the word of God for you, for me, for all people, and we say... Thanks be to God. So our theme for the year is uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When Jesus said, I am the way, he is communicating to you and me that he is the example for us to live by. So as a disciple, when he says, follow me, if we say, yes, I will follow Jesus, then we are saying that we want to follow the example of Jesus to become like Jesus. So that's the way, and that's the theme for the year. And we look at uh, this month, and we're looking at food for the way. What do you need in your spiritual journey? What is the spiritual food for the spiritual journey? So uh, the question of the, of the week today, if some of you looked at that in your Connect card, the, the question of the week is, what advice does your doctor give you uh, that you normally don't follow? That's the, that's the question of the week. And for you know, those of you under the age of 18, you may not be getting this as much. Uh, I asked that earlier in one of the earlier services, and one of the 12-year-olds said, uh, brush your teeth. And I'm like, we probably didn't need to know that, but uh, if that applies to you, you should definitely need to brush your teeth if you haven't been doing that lately. So that might be the, the word from our dentist, brush and floss and those kinds of things. But from your doctor, for most of us, we get a certain age, and we go to the doctor every year, and we get the exact same advice from the doctor, and the doctor says, what? Exercise and lose weight. Exercise and lose weight. So losing weight means eating a healthy diet. So we're going to put it in perspective, in that perspective today, uh, not necessarily the losing weight perspective, but eating a healthy diet, exercising. So... Uh, I've had that advice from my doctor because uh, I normally order fries wherever I go. So I, had to, I began to change that and listen to my doctor. And so I don't order fries every time, even though last night at the restaurant I really wanted to order those skillet fries on the menu. Sounded really good. Uh, but I, I usually order a salad with blue cheese dressing. Now, my doctor says, please don't order salads with blue cheese dressing. You've, uh, you've negated any good that you've done. But, uh, but I'm not in that habit yet. At least I'm salad over fries, but I still have the blue cheese dressing. So that's what I ordered, and then the waitress came out, and she said, I am so sorry to inform you. We do not carry blue cheese dressing. I'm like, how did I know that from this? Why do I come to this restaurant? And uh, so I said, okay, I will take the vinaigrette that's prescribed with the salad. So that's, that's what I did. So sometimes we make healthy decisions whether we want to or not because that's our only choice that we have. Now, that doesn't mean I don't get fries every once in a while. I get fries a lot, but just not every time. So anyway, so we're, we're supposed to eat healthy and we're supposed to exercise. Now, uh, that's all relevant, isn't it? You know, exercising for some people is exercising doing this, all right? I got, my, I got the lift going on, the fork, I got the food, I got it with my mouth. Some, some people, we joke about that. Now, uh, so, so spiritual health, exercise, and we want to be like Jesus. And I, I did a devotion, I have this devotion, you can text it and all that. If you don't sign up, I don't take that personal. But uh, I have a devotion, and a few weeks ago I... I had this devotion about the Desert Fathers, and somebody came to me and said, you know, I read your devotion, I don't have a clue who the Desert Fathers were. So, I want to share with you the Desert Fathers. I've explained them before, but I'll, I'll explain them again, because it's a lot of fun. Second and third century, 
Christianity is still in the Roman Empire. Christianity is not yet recognized by the Roman Empire. But there are people who are following Jesus, coming to know Jesus, and trying to be like Jesus. And they're living in an evil world, a difficult world. Lots of temptation around. Can anybody relate to that? An evil world with lots of temptation around. Every day there's temptation around us. And so some Christians came to the belief, came to the decision, came to the conclusion. Let me put it in context today. If I want to live a holy life, then I can't be hanging around you guys anymore. That was basically the conclusion they came to. I'm living my life around all these evil people. The only way, if I'm going to really live like Christ, am I really going to follow the Christ example, I've got to remove myself from all you evil people and go out and just be one-on-one -on -one with God. So, so there was this movement, second and third century. These people, they left their communities, they left, left their families, they, they left their churches, they, they left their jobs, and they went out and they lived off the land in the, in the wilderness area outside of civilization. And uh, so they, they separated themselves from gluttonous people. They separated themselves from adulterous people. They separated themselves from murderous people. They separated themselves from all those people. And they went out alone, and there was one problem with trying to be like Jesus all by yourself. They couldn't separate themselves from themselves. And what they discovered was all the evil that's in the world, when you remove yourself from the evil in the world, it doesn't remove the evil from within us. And so the, the desert fathers was a terrible mistake. Uh, and so that ended up being a movement, and it's over, and except for people today who say, I can't live with you folks, and they go live on their own as hermits. So uh, they identified... What we have today, the benefit we have today from these desert fathers is what we call the seven deadly what? The seven deadly sins. You've heard that. They've even had a movie about it. I didn't see the movie. The seven deadly sins. So the seven deadly sins emerged from these desert fathers who identified the sin within us. And one of the sins that they identified was gluttony, right? Now, we don't really take that seriously as one of the serious sins, right? I mean, we see murder as a sin. We see prejudice as a sin. Uh, we see adultery as a sin. But gluttony, we have a tendency to kind of laugh that one off. I mean, just go to any church pitch-in, and you'll see overeating in abundance, right? Uh, matter of fact, we live in a society where we encourage, please, eat more, take all that you want, take all that you need. And so we have to measure that in this in this world of plenty of food, and we do live in a world with plenty of food, uh, so that we're not overeating physically. But gluttony hurts our spiritual life. Now, this isn't necessarily a message about gluttony, but it's all going to fit together. Now, I really wish I had thought about this message while I was out to eat last night. I didn't give this message a thought. I didn't give the scripture a thought. I knew I was going to be talking about gluttony, but I, at the restaurant, none of that was crossing my mind. Um, I made that wise choice of uh, a salad, and I ate you know, a pretty decent meal. I didn't overeat. And then the waitress comes to us after our meal and says, would you like any dessert? And of course, all five of us looked at each other, and we all knew the answer should be no. And we all really wanted dessert, and so we're kind of toying with that, debating that. And so I just happened to mention, hey, I think we're just a couple blocks, blocks from the comfy cow. And so that really appealed to everyone. And plus we, had to, we decided that we would walk to get there, right? So it ended up only being one block. So we walked the whole block to the comfy cow. And so, so we go into the comfy cow. And I'd, I'd been there a couple of times before. I mean, I don't frequent there all the time. I, I go to Zesto about every day, but not the Comfy Cow. That's just special occasions, right? So I, so I go to the Comfy Cow, and, and, as, and I walk in, and, and right here, the first thing you come to, there's this, there's this case full of stuff. And then you get to the counter, and, you just like look, and I look at all the selections and decide what kind of ice cream. And, um, you know, you have your regular scoop, your large scoop, your double scoop, and your triple scoop. Now... Triple scoop is excess. That's definitely gluttonous. I would never get a triple scoop. 
Really, the reason is I don't want to pay the price for a triple scoop. That's the real reason. As a matter of fact, the question of the week two weeks ago was, what's your favorite food? Guess what the number one answer was? It was ice cream, far and away. Then the second answer was steak. I don't know what that says about us, but there we go. And, and so, uh, so I'm looking at the ice cream. I'm looking at the prices. And when the, when the lady says, uh, can I help you? I said, uh, how much is a piece of ice cream pie? And she says, it's four sixty-five. And I'm looking at the prices of ice cream. One large scoop of ice cream is five sixty-five. I'm thinking, I can save a dollar. I could save a dollar by getting a piece of ice cream pie. How frugal I am. I'll take a piece of ice cream pie. And so here's all the ice cream pies. They have a list of them. Oh, I have, my, I have lots of choices. And I choose the pie called Love Shack. How can you go wrong with the Love Shack piece of pie? And so I'll take the Love Shacks. And so it's uh, got a name of an ice cream I can't pronounce. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure it's wonderful. And so she has it. And before she gives it to me, she asks me this question. Would you like hot fudge or caramel drizzled on it? I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. And she says, would you like to have both? I said, that would be wonderful. And so she gives me this wonderful piece of ice cream pie with drizzling with hot fudge and caramel and a big pile of whipped cream. And I take it, and I sit with the, my group of people, and I'm like, all of a sudden I realize what I'm preaching on tomorrow. I'm like, okay, I can't eat all of this pie. Not because I can't, but because I'm preaching on gluttony tomorrow. And so I do not eat in excess. I ate all but one bite, and I did not eat... And I did not eat the whipped cream. And man, was it good. So, anyway, one of the things about gluttony, one of, one, of, one of the things about it is, it's a little different for all of us. We have to decide what is enough for us and what is excess. What is enough for you? What is enough for me? And what is, in a, what is excess? And, and so, uh, we need food. That's the one thing about food. We need food. You know, we don't need heroin. We don't need heroin. But some people take heroin, and they have such an urge for heroin. One dose of heroin, heroin is one dose too many. And heroin kills people. And so we look at heroin and we say, oh, that's really, really bad. But it's the same sinfulness, the same urge within us that longs for heroin as it does for that alcohol or that sugar in that food or something else. It's the same thing. It's a desire to want more than what we really need. It's all right there together. So we have to be very careful because gluttony is consuming in excess of what we need. So we come to that, and individually, one scoop of ice cream may be in excess for you because of whatever your diet is or wherever you are in your physical life. But you might be in a, in a situation where three scoops of ice cream is, is no big deal. I mean, some of these uh, professional players, they eat like five steaks instead of a six-ounce steak. I mean, they, eat, they consume all this food because they're exercising so much. But your exercise and your food, all that needs to be together. So that's the, that's the physical part. That's the diet part. So here I am. I'm your pastor, and I want to say to you, for your spiritual journey, you need to have a good, healthy diet of spiritual food and a good, healthy exercise program for your spiritual life. So that's where I'm coming from. And even before I, get, even as I was creating this message, I knew that you're not going to take my advice because you're not taking the advice of your doctor, so you won't take my advice. So I'm going to try anyway, okay? So here we go. What is the spiritual food for the journey? Well, there are several. I'm just going to name three. The first one, spiritual food, comes in worship. Worship is when the people, the believers of God, come together to worship a holy God. And we worship a holy God because God is worthy of our worship. Now, I come, I come in contact with folks every once in a while who will say to me, I can worship by myself. Well, Instead of going into that debate, let me tell you, every time worship is mentioned in Scripture, it's always in community. Worship is done in community. Worship is the people of God, the body of Christ, 
coming together to worship the Holy God. We come together in gratefulness. We come together to give Him praise. And, and worship really isn't about the song that you sing, the message that you hear. Worship is about the body of believers recognizing that God is a holy God and that in this particular message, God has provided everything we need for the journey. Everything we need, whether it's physical, whether it's financial, whether it's spiritual, whether it's mental. God provides everything we need. So this is our response, our corporate response is worship. And our corporate response is God You've given us everything we need. You are worthy to be praised. We might sing that. We might say that. We might pray that. Whatever it is we do, but it's done in a setting of worship. So if you're a, a, a believer in Jesus Christ and you want to become like Jesus and you want to give God praise, then worship isn't something you, you decide on Sunday morning, should I go or should I not go? Worship is something that you, you go. You, it's not a decision you make. It's something that you do. It's response. And it gives you the food you need for the journey. So we get our food from the worship setting because we are responding. It's about what we're doing in response to what God has already done for us. And from that, we are fed. Another place we get fed is through prayer. Uh, there were several people that went on, um, uh, had a spiritual retreat yesterday right here, a, a women's prayer. If anybody was there yesterday, did that, great, great, good to... Good to have you with us uh, yesterday. Um, it was all about prayer. So a whole day focused on, on prayer. Prayer is spiritual food. Now, I, I, came, in, I came kind of uh, to the conviction that I needed to have a prayer life in, in my early 20s. I really didn't have that. I mean, I knew prayer was important, but I really didn't have a disciplined prayer life. I didn't have a, a, a daily prayer life. And, and part of the reason the, the conviction came is when I, when I realized that my concept of Christianity was wrong. All right? I, can't, I always had the understanding growing up and in my 20s that Christianity was a religion. It was a set of moral codes, a set of conduct, a, a rules of do's and don'ts, and, and a, a way to live, a way to kind of design your life. And so I saw Christianity as a religion. But somewhere in my 20s, I began to understand that Christianity is not a religion. That Christianity is a relationship with Jesus Christ, who God who loved us sent to die on the cross for your sins and for mine, is now resurrected and lives and reigns forever. And, and I, I, when I became to understand that Christianity is a relationship, that's when prayer emerged as something that's important. Because now prayer is not a ritual that I need to do because I'm a Christian. Prayer is now a conversation I have with a living God who loves me. So it's a, it's a relationship piece. And so prayer is a relationship. So, so if, you're, if you're praying daily, you're, you're continuing the relationship with Jesus daily. You are, um, you are keeping that relationship and you're being fed through that prayer. Your spiritual life doesn't dry up because of your circumstances, because you're in that relationship with God. So when bad things come, you know, you go straight to God because you have that relationship with Him through that prayer. It's already established. Now, before I came to that understanding, uh, I would pray once a week. I was very regular at worship. I'd pray once a week, and it was sitting out there where you sat, and when the pastor said, let us pray, I'd bow my head, and I'd pray whatever the pastor was praying. I'd just be sitting there silent in prayer, and then, uh, and then I might nod off a little bit because it was prayed a long prayer. <laughs> and then he'd say amen, and I'd all of a sudden come back to life. That was my prayer. I prayed daily. Whatever the pastor prayed, that was my prayer. That was my, day, that was my weekly prayer. That was my weekly prayer. And then I began to understand I needed to have a daily prayer life. So this is what I did. Someone told me that I needed to pray every morning when I got up. I get up, that's the first thing I do. So in my 20s, very impressionable, that's what I did. Now, here was my routine before I started my prayer life. My routine was, I'd deal, well, I won't, don't say I woke up at 3.50. The alarm went off at 3.50, and then I hit the alarm several times. Some of them came to a terrible death in those, in those months that I set the alarm for 3.50. Set the alarm for 3.50, get ready, 4.20, get in my car. I'd be at work at 10 till 5, clocking at 5 o'clock. So, 
What does that mean to me if you say to me, you need to start your day? So instead of 3.50, now I'm setting my alarm for 3.20. I get up at 3.20 in the morning. I, take, I, I, I go in to, and I sit and I have a little piece of paper for a little prayer journal and I have my Bible open. And what that meant was I would pray for two minutes and then I'd sleep upright for 28 until my alarm went off again. It didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. I was convicted that I needed a daily prayer life, but I had to find my own way to, to fit that in to different parts of the day and, and found that the evening was a great time for me. Now I pray in the morning, I pray in the evening, I'm praying as the day goes on. Some, God puts somebody on my heart, I pray for that person right away. It's more of a flowing conversation. It's not a discipline I have to develop. But you may be at the point where you need to develop the discipline and have that conversation. So you need to find that time for you. And let me share this with you. You're responsible for your own prayer life. You're responsible for your own worship life. I can't do that for you. Someone else can't do that for you. God has given you everything you need to develop that worship life. God has given you everything you need to develop that prayer life relationship with Him. The third area I want to talk about is reading your Bibles, getting into a Bible study. God has given us His bread, bread of life, His Word, for us to discover Him. This Bible was written to point us to God, to tell us about Jesus, so that we might follow the example of Jesus Christ. So, you, so food for your spiritual journey, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The Word of God is right here. This is food for our journey. Now, I was convicted that I needed to read that too. I need to learn about Jesus. So I'd incorporate daily Bible time uh, into my life. And some of you may say, you know, I just don't have time to read my Bible. And, and start to pray. If you have time for prayer, start to pray. God, create space in my life so that I can read your word. You know what? God will honor that prayer. God will honor that prayer. All of a sudden, you'll realize, you'll find space. Because as you're praying to God, God creates space in my life so that I can read your word and learn more about you. You'll be in a situation on a, on a Tuesday, and uh, God will prompt you, hey, this would be a good time. Now, whether you get your Bible and read it and look at it, that's up to you. You're responsible for your own faith journey. You're responsible for, for your own food. I mean, God has already provided the food, but you've got to go out and pick it up. You're the one that has to consume it. So that's what we're doing to be spiritually nourished. Those are just three areas. There's more, but we'll just stop at three. So now we're getting a healthy diet. We're starting to take in the Word of God. We've got a prayer life going on. We're in worship every Sunday, and we continue to do that. But what happens is, is if you're not exercising your faith, then you're going to be spiritually overweight. Spiritually overweight. Now... Some of you say, well, I'll just quit praying as much. You know, I'll just quit reading my Bible as much. It doesn't quite work that way. We are, just supposed, to be, we are supposed to be spiritually fed. We take responsibility for that ourselves. We're living that life, and then we exercise our faith. That's part of it. So what does that mean? How do we exercise our faith? Well, Jesus showed us how to exercise our faith. John 13, he washes his disciples' feet. He uses that as an example. What I have done for you, you are to do for one another and to others. Serving is exercise. We serve the people around us. We serve the body of believers by encouraging each other and equipping each other to go out and make disciples. And then we serve those who are, those who are uh, hungry, we feed them. Those who are thirsty, we give them something to drink. Those who are uh, hurting and in the hospital, we visit them. Those who are... Uh, lost a loved one, we give them a call and say, how are you doing? We're serving by being the body of Christ, by doing. You know, one of the, one of the things that gets me a lot is, uh, you know, when I go to the doctor, if I, if I decide to give my doctor a hard time, which isn't too often anymore because uh, I receive way too much than I give out. But um, I will say this. Uh, why, haven't you, why haven't you perfected your trade yet? And they'll look at me and like, well, you're, you know, you're, you go to school, you go to residency, you've been a doctor for 20 years, and you're still practicing. You know, I, you're still practicing your, your medicine. Why haven't you perfected this yet? When are you going to perfect it? I want, a, I want a doctor that's perfected 
this medicine thing. Not one that's practicing. I don't want you practicing on me. I want you to have it figured out. So I don't say that as much anymore, but that's what happens. We, we are getting fed spiritually, and then we practice our faith in the world. We test our faith in the world. Circumstances come. Difficulties come, and that tests our faith. We're practicing it. We're serving one another. We're serving a broken world so that those people who are broken and hurting and, and evil in our eyes might come to see the light of Christ and might come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So that's one way to exercise our faith is through serving. Another way to exercise our faith is through giving. You know, we give generously. Um, generosity is not something that can be commanded. Generosity is something that's developed within us spiritually so that we can become like Christ. So come back to giving in just a little bit. Let's go to one style of serving. I want to go back to serving. I skipped, I skipped an illustration I really want to tell you, so I'm going to go back and tell you. All right, so I have a new member class. I do a new member class about every two or three times a year. Whenever I get 10 or 15 people that say, hey, I'd like to be a member, we do a class. So I'm in this new member class, uh, sh sharing them about the service areas because I want everyone to serve because we need to be worshiping, we need to be serving, we need to be giving, we need to be doing these things to practice our faith and to keep that relationship. So one of the things I always tell people is about the hospitality team. Now, hospitality team, we have our greeters, we have our uh, people who give out coffee, uh, we have uh, doors, we have ushers, we have all those things. So all this is part of the hospitality team. And then I say this, and if you haven't heard this from me, uh, you need to hear this today, whether you're a member or not. Everyone here today is a member of the Wesley Chapel hospitality team. You're a member whether you know it or not. You're a member whether you, you're a member, you're part of the hospitality team whether you want to be or not. Because guess what? When you pulled up in the, in the parking lot today and you walked in here, if anybody new showed up today, and we usually have eight or ten people who come for the first time about every week. So someone who's brand new, never been to worship here before, they pulled up and they parked beside you. All right? How do you interact with that person? Now, it may have been someone who's been going here for five years and you've just never seen them before. But how do you respond? Do you greet them? Do you welcome them? Hey, glad you're here. Hey, I don't think uh, we've had the opportunity to meet before. I'm Tony. Uh, what's going on? Or, or do you just ignore the people around you and come in? Because a new person, they're going to make their impression of Wesley Chapel in the first seven minutes. That's before they ever get to see me. You know, even if, my, even if I have a stellar sermon, if, if we have not shown hospitality as a group of people, they've already made their decision, they're never coming back again. Now, you might have a great impression and be very friendly, and then they hear me, and then they say, I'm never coming back again, all right? That could happen, and that does, I'm sure. But we're all part of the hospitality team. So, so that's Comfy Cow. Folks at the Comfy Cow are great. And the Comfy Cow is next to a bank parking lot, which was roped off because they just resealed the bank parking lot, okay? Now, ever since I can remember, uh, at least the six years that I've been here, that bank parking lot had signs at every parking space. Vehicle will be towed at owner's expense. Bank parking only, all right? So how is that in the hospitality ranks? Where would you rate that on a 1 to 10 and being hospitable? Zero or one, right? Not very hospitable, but it's their parking lot. They can decide who parks there and who doesn't. So they repaved it. We leave. I leave my one bite of ice cream on the plate. Not going in excess. I didn't eat it all. We walk out in the parking lot, and we're walking by. They have new signs. New signs. I took a picture of it. Let me, let, me re, let me read you what the new sign says. It has the name of the bank. And it says this. Courtesy space. Enjoy our local merchants. Life needs a great bank. I'm like, hospitality. They went from a 1 to a 10 in one sign. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? So serving, giving. Now, 
here we, here we come to this situation. Let's go to the scripture today. I haven't even talked about 2 Corinthians 8. The whole context of 2 Corinthians 8 is, is about finances. It's about seeing God as the provider of everything that we have. And it's about, it's a letter to the Corinthians to be willing and generous to share the resources that they have with some other churches, with some other bodies of believers. Now, I, I used to hear stories that all the Christians in the first century were poor, um, you know, da-da-da-da-da-da. But when you read scripture, you know that there were some, some pretty well-off Christians. I mean, you had Lydia, who's a merchant, a seller of purple. So evidently, the Corinthian church, this is a church that has some means. Because Paul is saying to them, you have excess. You have all that you need. And you need to be willing to share the excess that you have with this other church who's right now going through a real difficult time. And they need, they need your help. So you have that going on. So then at the end of the passage, and he doesn't make it a commandment. It's very interesting. Paul doesn't say, this is a command, you should share your excess. Because you can't make a commandment on the generosity of the heart. That has to be developed through a prayer life with God. But he has this quote. As it was written long ago, those who have much did not have too much, and those who have little did not have too little. Well, when was that written long ago prior to Paul's writing? It was written in Exodus chapter 16. Now, this is where the food comes in. So you have the people of God, right? The Hebrews, the people of God. They've been slaves for 400 years in Egypt. They, really, Egypt, even to be a slave in Egypt, economically is really pretty well off. I mean, they, Egypt is the, the superpower of the world. Uh, for many years, they had a lot of uh, resources. So, but God has released them from Egypt. And they're on their way to the promised land. And the promised land is a land full of milk and honey. Oh, it's going to be a great place. Lots of food. Food for everybody. Lots of stuff. You're going to love it in the promised land. It's what we've always wanted. It's what we've been praying for for 400 years. We're on our way. But the problem is there was this journey through the wilderness in the between time. And even though they came from abundance, and they were going away as free people with abundance, there was this journey through the wilderness, and they weren't real happy about it. And so what does God do? God provides bread from heaven. We call it manna. God provides this bread from heaven. And he says, this is for you, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to go out every morning. It's going to be there. Every morning I want you to go out, and I want you to gather. And, and, and God says this to the people. Take as much as you need. Interesting there what he does not say. He doesn't say, take as much as you want. No, take as much as you need. And so the people went out and they gathered. And it says, those who had much did not have too much. Those who had little did not have too little. And the whole concept in Exodus 16, because we miss it because of our 21st century individualist mentality that we have in America today. We miss it because it's a corporate statement. All the people who gathered together had everything they needed. Now, you had to be personally responsible. You had to go out and you had to pick up the bread. The bread God provided the bread, but you had to go out and pick it up. God provides you everything you need for your spiritual journey. If you ever say, I'm not being fed, if you ever say, I'm not getting anything out of anything, somewhere along the line, you have got to be responsible for your own spiritual journey. God has provided everything you need for your spiritual journey. And you gather as much as you need, not as much as you want. You may not have everything you want, but I guarantee you have everything you need for your spiritual journey. And so they go out and gather, and it says... Those who gathered much did not have too much. Those who gathered little did not have too little. Paul takes this statement from, from Exodus, from a bunch of grumbling uh, grumblers, and uh, applies it to New Testament, that God provides everything that we need. 
Now, I got I got to tell you one of my favorite my favorite part of Exodus. Every time I talk about Exodus 16, I did I do have to say a little part of this because there were a few that were prone to gluttony. There were a few that were prone to greediness. There were a few who, although they gathered as much as they needed for the day, they decided to save some for the next day. Where God said, don't save any for tomorrow. Why? Why would you not need to save any for tomorrow? There's going to be more tomorrow. God's going to provide what you need tomorrow. But there were some who decided, I've had enough for today. I'm going to save this for tomorrow, just in case God won't provide tomorrow. Silly, isn't it? So when they woke up the next day, they found that the bread they had saved the night before was full of maggots. Ugh. Spoiled. Wasn't any good. Be careful. It's easy to criticize the Hebrews in Exodus 16, but we do the same thing. God gives us everything we need. And when we begin to get gluttonous or hoarding, when we begin to not trust that God is going to provide tomorrow, when God says he's going to provide for you tomorrow too, we tend to keep the excess of what we don't need. A lot going on here. Here's where I want to leave it. By the way, if anybody from any of the first services asks you about the spoon illustration, tell them I didn't use it with you either. Got spoons in my pocket. Ran out of time first service. Ran out of time second service. It'll come again. Spoon illustration will be there. So what are you going to get out of today? First, God has provided everything you need for the journey. Trust God to provide today. Second, you've got to take some personal responsibility to gather what God has provided you. You can't rely on somebody else. Put those into practice. Third thing I want you to get out of today. Christian faith is not a religion. It's a relationship with a loving God. That's what we need to develop. Let us pray. Most holy God, we, we come to you this morning. We... Um, we live in a world of gluttony and excess, and we are part of the problem. And Lord, it's not what we have, it's our mentality toward what we have. We see, you see abundance, you see everything that we've provided, and we see scarcity, we see it's not enough, we see it's not going to make it, we see that it may not show up tomorrow. Forgive us, forgive us, God. You have been so faithful and all you've promised to do is to be faithful today and tomorrow. Increase our faith, O oh God, and help us to put these relationship pieces into practice so we can be spiritually full. And Lord, let us not rest so that we have it for ourselves, but that we serve and give and share our lives with one another and with those who do not know you so they may see your provision in your son Jesus Christ as well. All things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.